Good morning. Welcome on this beautiful, sunny, somewhat snowy, cold morning. Um, and hello to those of you on the internet tubes who are watching as well. We're streaming this live. Um, my name is Paul Ohm. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Colorado Law School. Um, and I'm also the initiative director here at Silicon Flatirons for our intellectual property and information technology efforts. Um, one of the wonderful things about our center um, is that we've all been able to kind of carry on the traditions, capabilities, and legacies of the man who started it all, Phil Weiser. Uh, Phil has been our executive director when he's not in DC trying to save the world. Um, and this is, I think, my first opportunity to introduce Phil with his second hat on as well. Um, as many of you know, as of six months ago, five months ago, uh, Phil has become the new dean of the University of Colorado Law School. Um, and so I thought it was uh, not only fitting, but wonderful to have Phil come up and say a few comments before um, I get into my introductory remarks. So without further ado, Phil Weiser. So it is a great pleasure to be here. I feel like part of what I am doing is uh, giving a blessing uh, to Paul in this gathering. It is easy to uh, do so because this effort is timely, exciting, and really uh, very much in the spirit of what Silicon Flatirons is about. So let me talk a little about each of those. It's timely because we arranged this week to have both a settlement with the FTC about mm -hmm. Facebook's privacy practices and a national scandal about carrier ID on which our own Paul Ohm has been widely quoted. It's also timely because in Congress and in the administration, there is increasing unrest and uncertainty about how do we address data privacy. There is a sense among consumers that something is broken, that they are not getting it straight from providers, and that is sort of a almost existential unease. And how to think about that from an economic lens and from a social policy lens is critically important. The economic lens, of course, is also related to another existential fear, which is if there is an overly restrictive approach, you can kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. That is, the internet economy powered on data wants to have access to data that can be monetized, think targeted advertising, etc. And so we are in a very interesting discussion. And here at Silicon Flatirons University of Colorado, not only is Paul Ohm a national leader, but we have Scott Pepit, Harry Certain, Pierre Wang just joined us, who brings us a depth of the economic analysis. Vic Fleischer is here as well. We have a community of scholars here, and we have a community of supporters around the ecosystem who empower us and who obligate us to elevate this discussion. And having come from Washington, I am very aware that elevated discussions are sometimes in short supply, and yet we need them desperately, which is why I'm so happy to have not just fellow academics, both here and across the country joining us, but some folks from Washington uh, who are here as well. So that's why it's timely. It's in the spirit of Silicon Flatirons because Silicon Flatirons is about engaging in cutting edge discussions in a way that elevates the discourse and a way that also brings our students into this. So Eli Quinn, who can't be here because he's in Washington now, was one of Paul's students, took the technology policy clinic with Bad Brad Bernthal, and started a docket at the Public Utilities Commission here in Colorado. I think Bill Levis is here from the Consumer Council. And the docket was what to do about data privacy in the smart grid ecosystem. Literally, in the spirit of Wayne Gretzky, seeing where the puck is going, opening up a investigatory docket in Colorado, I believe the first docket of its kind in the country, helping to grapple with what is a big unsolved question. And the level of student engagement we've had over the years is frankly our biggest point of pride and many of the students here will have a chance to visit with other academics, folks in government. And I think one other point that I have to say is as we look at the world, we can take the following point. This internet thing, this technology revolution, it's for real. Um, you'd be surprised how often people underappreciate that. So, for example, our colleague Scott Pepit has written an article talking about how we need to ask whether the internet, how the internet is going to change 
the ability of people to understand and enter into contracts. Um, I think for traditional contract scholars, that's a threatening concept that the internet can be disruptive. But for people in the internet ecosystem, it's of course it's disruptive. That's the whole point. And one more shout out I have to give is to our new librarian, Susan Mark, who's here. And one of the great things, and again, we have Paul Ohm to thank, who is on the search committee, to get a librarian who is a 21st century librarian about information and cares about information policy is yet another arrow in our quiver, so to speak. So Susan, we're so glad to have you here as well. So I'm sorry for all the people I haven't acknowledged, but let me um, finally acknowledge Anna Noskazy from Silicon Flatirons, because to say that I'm executive director is actually, I'm trying to get away from that title and call it faculty director, because the person who's doing all the executing is really Anna. And Anna has a fabulous team that she has um, working with her, Jamie, a set of students, and we've just brought a new person on, Catherine, as well. So thanks to everyone who's making this possible, and what you have for me is my deep remorse that as the dean, I can't spend the day with you all. What I will do is come back to the reception and look to a few of you to try to summarize some of what I've missed to throw me a few morsels of the interesting insights. So Paul, thank you so much for being you. And um, I give you all my uh, blessing to go ahead and, and uh, really um, have a wonderful day's discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Before you leave, Phil, there's two things you said that confused me. One, I thought you were required to ask for money now as dean, and so the fact that you didn't <laughs> was quite a surprise. And then two, you complimented my participation in, in the hiring of Susan, but I thought I was on every search committee in this building. And so, um, at any rate, th thank you, Phil, um, once again. Uh, I don't want to take too much time with prefatory remarks. There is a very, very packed and rich schedule in store for all of you today, um, but I can't resist the, the couple of minutes to try and situate how we got here today um, and some of my personal goals for what we're going to have in our ensuing conversations. So this is the fourth time Silicon Flatirons has assembled on the very last day of the semester. Um, it's, it's kind of heroic that our students, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out one or two of them later, um, participated at all today because they have final exams in about 72 hours for most of them. Um, and every year I've tried to ramp up the scope, scale, ambition of what I'm doing with this, what is now a series. Uh, in 2008, we assembled and we talked about the law and ethics of network monitoring. This is right after the summer of Nebuad and Form, and I'm sure for a lot of you with ISPs, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Three years ago, and this is where I, I like to think I was a little prescient, we did um, a conference on ECPA reform, um, and we had Jim Dempsey here now, who has become uh, the kind of central figure in many ways in ECBA reform, um, as well as a bunch of other people discussing that. Last year uh, was a bit of a departure, but a wonderful departure. Um, we had a conference on privacy in the press, and we teamed with um, people in political science in our Constitutional Law Center, uh, and we talked about emerging issues on social networks um, and in other places having to do with uh, privacy. Now, the thing we also instituted last year for the first time very much followed in the tradition of Phil Weiser, which was last year was the very first quote-unquote academic conference where academics presented papers that we subsequently worked with the students to publish in the journal on telecommunications and high technology law. Um, that's what Phil's been doing for 10 years in telecommunications law. Uh, I can never resist saying this, and I'm sure some of you are sick of me saying this. We are the journal in the conference where the term network neutrality was first uttered. Of the first 10 interesting papers on network neutrality, five, six, seven of them were in our journal through our conference. And my stated goal has always been, I want to do for privacy what Phil Weiser has managed to do for telecommunications law. I may not be able to have the next great idea, but I want to convene the people that I think can. And I want to take this opportunity on the last day of every fall semester to have that conversation, to bring these people together. Um, so that brings me to today's iteration. Today we're talking about the economics of privacy. In many ways, this is a conference with a thesis statement. I've never done that before. And the thesis statement is that the legal academy has by and large ignored markets and economics in conversations about privacy. And they've done so, I think, for pretty good reason. Because about 10 years ago, with the dawn of the explosion, exploding commercial internet, a few people started using markets in, I think, very kind of unsophisticated ways. And a few commentators said, 
That doesn't make sense. We should move past markets. We should situate this more in kind of autonomy and philosophy and postmodern thought. And that thinking has kind of taken hold among most of the people who write in this field. At the same time now, this is a field that has hundreds, well, maybe not hundreds, a hundred people who, to larger or smaller extent, call themselves information privacy scholars. And yet, discussions about economics are very, very absent. Now, it's a strange thing to lob in this audience today um, because the, the professors in law who are nuanced and careful and thoughtful about economics are all sitting here. Um, and that's partly why I was hoping they would come, and I was so thrilled that so many did. Those of you who are practitioners in the room are checking your programs thinking, I, I've come to the wrong event. Um, I didn't think this was going to be academics navel-gazing, talking about why are we not talking about economics. That's the frame for today, but I don't think it's the content of today. Um, as Phil has already alluded to, information privacy has become such a salient, day-to-day, -day headline grabbing topic that I hope throughout the day we will take the time to look at things from kind of the detached heights of the academic and from the ground struggles of the practitioners and, and perhaps more importantly the regulators and I'm, I'm thrilled to have Joe Farrell and Julie Brill from the Federal Trade Commission uh, as well as Peter Swire with his deep experience in the administration as well to think about regulatory solutions, self-regulatory solutions co-regulatory, whatever that means. So during the day, someone can tell you what a co-regulatory solution is. Um, this, this is not intended to be something that practitioners uh, will cogitate for a day, find it somewhat intellectual stimulating, and then not bring it back to your jobs. Uh, quite the contrary, I think this will be a day that will enrich everything uh, you do in privacy. That's at least the ambition. The format is packed. I made a list about nine months ago of the top 12 people I wanted to attend. Ten of them said yes, I've never had that problem before. Um, and so we have three panels, we have three keynotes. Um, Today is going to be a day of stamina. We have coffee in the other room. Uh, make sure you fuel up from time to time. Um, after the conference uh, in fall 2012, you will see the printed publication that results from the papers that are being introduced today. My hope is that it has a very long shelf life, that this is something we cite and something we recognize in a few years as the start of um, a really nice nuanced discussion of economics and privacy. Um, there is a Twitter hashtag. There always is at Silicon Flatirons. Uh, so it's hash Flatirons. Um, I, as kind of master of ceremonies and occasional moderator, will be looking at the stream during the day. Um, I will not promise to ask questions that are asked in the stream because, frankly, a lot of grumpy people often sit on the stream. Um, but I will, I will leave open the possibility that we will uh, answer some questions. Um, and like Phil, I wanted to uh, end briefly before introducing our first speaker, um, thanking not only Anna Noskesi, Jamie Stewart, um, Meg Ambrose, who is my PhD student, is running audiovisual somewhere in the back room and is becoming a really interesting privacy scholar in her own right. Uh, but the person who deserves the most credit today is Lauren Bozell. Lauren, wave to the audience. Lauren is our uh, 2L symposium editor for today's event. Uh, she has been tireless in organizing people, getting them in the right places, making sure the guy at the restaurant got paid last night. Um, and so for that, I'm really, really grateful. And thank you. And if you can give a round of applause to Silicon Planet. Thank you. I also can't let it go without thanking uh, Tech Freedom and Baron Zoka. Baron, are you in the room? Not yet. Baron Zoka will be joining us later. Um, has agreed to co-sponsor this event, uh, as well as the Federal Communications Bar Association. And we're really, really grateful uh, for them and all of our sponsors in Silicon Flatirons.